clearly the action happening at the state level is more aggressive than what this has ended up being. But even still, obviously, you, you know, you're not happy with it clearly. And I think they, there are a number of statements in there that, that do, I mean, they're alluding to you and personally, frankly. Yeah. And in the NPRMs, they mention some of our websites and, and like in the regulatory impact analysis, which will get almost no press coverage at all, you know, outside of us discussing it. They say like, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 to $14 million of lost revenue. I mean, they don't analyze how it affects our, our wider industry, how it affects people's uh, lost jobs and the decline of manufacture. I mean, I, I think it, especially just knowing Central Texas and other places just around our ecosystem, there's tons of shops and FFLs and otherwise legal businesses that make a lot of money and extra money on making gun parts and receiver kits mm -hmm. and, and helping people, you know, customize that stuff. And th there's a, a huge swath of activity, which is, I, I think, still going to be wiped out by the rule, even with how, you know, watered down it may appear to be. Uh, and this just isn't done in a serious way. It wasn't really done with the, the involvement of industry at all. They met with major stakeholders like prime manufacturers, I think like one month before they revealed the, the NPRM, the, the first draft of the NPRM. It's just not mm -hmm. a serious process. It's just an attempt to torture the definition of firearm in the, in the GCA and, and pretend there's a public safety merit to it. Yeah, it's interesting. They uh, changed their tune a bit in terms of uh, industry impact or impact on small businesses, right? I feel like it, if I remember correctly, initially they were saying that there wouldn't be you know, any impact because <laughs> yeah. people could just stop selling uh, the, the yeah. kits together and sell separately or whatever. But now they, after the comment period, the, which frankly they did, they changed a number of things after this comment period, right? The, some of the stuff you alluded to, but one of them was now they're saying, yeah, it's going to have some impact. Some businesses are going to go under because of this. And it's, it, but obviously they don't really specify who or, or how, but think about how out of their minds they were. If if they were going to let the final rules say, oh, there'd be no, there'd be no a zero impact, and we'll give you sixty days to comply. Right, right. You know, it's like okay, you're going to get sued and you're going to lose. So they they knew they had to change their tune because they're going to have, you know, five to ten major pieces of litigation about this now, and, and like this rule is not safe for that reason. So they they recognize, I think, especially with multi part receiver, they were, that was going to blow that rule up. Um, and, and think about probably the main reason they've allowed 80 percent receivers to survive is because that's it's not just how the ghost, the so-called ghost gun industry uh, is performed. It, it's literally a necessary part of how the major major rifles and pistol companies make their product in this country. You buy you buy these um, parts and process from your vendors who themselves are not licensed. You know, there's a whole ecosystem of like I'm buying blanks in uh, from my subcontractor or I'm importing them from a foreign country. On, you know, like there's there's just such a web of interconnected right. components and modern manufacture re requires so many different levels and processes of, let's say, partially complete components. Receivers or not, you know, like the ATF was monkeying around with things that like it was going to get wiped out on and probably still is. And, but they knew they had to fall back. Yeah, I know. Certainly, I think people have people might have an idea that the. Uh, you know, when Smith & Wesson makes a gun, everything, they're just bringing in molten steel to, to forge themselves and then make the entire right. gun through that. And it's like, that's not how, that's not how it works, especially with like a lot of ARs, right? There, every, there's 5,000 companies that make ARs or whatever. That's not yeah. the real number, but you get my point. And really, there's only, I think, three or four uh, OEMs that actually make the, of course. The, uh, the parts for that stuff. And a lot of people just put their roll mark on it. This whole game got started this way. When I look at the lawsuits against Polymer 80 last year, you know, the, the determination letters originally given by ATF, let's say like in the 70s and stuff to some of these manufacturers, were to people who were just designing what they thought was an economical manufacturing process for legitimate, you know, ARs and other guns. They just wanted to know, okay, at what stage of manufacture is it incomplete so I can have my subcontractor make a bunch of forgings and stuff so that like I can actually get my process to a, an affordable place. I mean, this is just political economy. It's just very basic political economy. And so, okay, once ATF makes these decisions, like there's a reliance interest here. And so, okay, there's a, there's a whole interstate network now of like, of manufacturers and contractors making AR 15 forged castings, you know, of non-receivers. Okay. Eventually other people will figure out how to turn those forged castings, you know, those, those forged receivers into complete guns. So you can't, you can't just erase the history of how this is all done. And of course, you can't erase the history of small scale digital manufacturing and gunsmithing. So they I don't know, they're in a corner. They're being told by their boss that they have to stop this activity, but they, they almost don't have a way to do it outside of a law from Congress saying, 
all right, fine. Nobody without a license can make a gun anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly, obviously, the ATF is under a lot of political pressure with with this uh, from the Biden administration. In fact, to the point where they even moved up the publication date several months uh, early uh, due to added pressure from the gun control groups, uh, which this was something of win for them, getting it moved up and getting a, a new ATF director nominee yeah. uh, pushed through or put, you know nominated. He hasn't been confirmed, obviously. Right, but, right. But, um, you know, it, it strikes me, though, that when I read this rule, what, what I see, you know, all the attention is on the ghost gun stuff. And it makes a lot of sense for you, obviously, because you're uh, somebody who's, who's making, um, you know, unfinished parts and, and selling, uh, you know, mills and, and so forth. And this is a big focus of you, both business wise and philosophically sort of political approach that you have. But when I read that rule, what I, what I really see the ATF doing is uh changing the definition of firearm because they got in trouble with it the current definition or the previous um, definition yeah. uh, in court because it was a very bad definition frankly uh that i think the atf has some uh certainly some reasonable complaints about how that definition was originally written back in the the 60s uh, or whenever it was initially adopted uh for what a receiver is because it had to include uh, you know, both both the, the breach block and the um, and the fire control group. And obviously most guns, there isn't one part that has all of the required components from that definition. So they've kind of just been operating in spite of that for 60 years, just um, ignoring what the actual official definition was. Uh, and then they started eventually having problems with this in yeah. court getting cases thrown out uh, against, you know, basically felons in possession of uh, AR-15 lowers. They couldn't convict them because the AR-15 lower doesn't fit the definition of a receiver as it was written in the federal rules. And so what I see is them trying to fix that problem and doing it. They, they stripped out all of the snark, but if you go back and read the leaked draft that uh, we published at the reload about a year ago, it was really very dripping with sarcasm and scorn at these judges who had thrown yeah. out their cases um, just because the, they were basically ignoring the, the, de the previous definition. And now they're like, well, fine, if you want us to define it. We're just going to go with this extremely broad definition and we're just going to use the same determinations that we used to. Uh, like, for instance, the AR-15, right, is a great example of this. The new the new definition says we're going to pick uh, the the enclosure for the 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 bolt basically on a rifle. Uh, well, the enclosure for the bolt on an AR-15 is the upper receiver, mm -hmm. but the regulated part is the lower receiver. And they said, well, we're going to make exceptions basically for what, what, how things already are, uh, and then like future designs, you will go by this this new rule. Uh, but it's just to, to essentially so they can continue to prosecute people for for, uh, you know, the felon in possession or something along those lines so that they're because their old definition was bad. Like, And then this this ghost gun stuff is kind of a political sideshow to me yeah. uh, for what's going on here. I think I think that's right. Yeah, and you're right that in that first draft of the rule, it's clear like the uh, the highest priority probably is to unify the definition of receiver so that they can continue. You know, running the show and act, acting like they've always known what's going on. But the whole flavor of the rule, even now, is something that like, well, see, we were always right. And it's just about justifying their kind of regulatory inertia. Yeah. And that extends now to the AR-15 receiver where, OK, and they're, when they're talking about the comments in, in support of the rule from, let's say, Brady and all these people who support the rule, you know, obviously those people want them to go further and make some kind of mm -hmm. uh, sensible definition of, of when something's a receiver or not. And they're like, nope, nope, actually our previous guidance is still good. And the AR-15 lower receiver is not a receiver until there's a pocket mill. So they, they just want everybody to respect how they've done everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, they basically, they didn't like what the judges said. They don't necessarily like what the industry is saying and they don't really like what the gun control groups are saying <laughs> completely either. They want what they want, <laughs> uh, which, you know, that's government agency for. I mean, that's just human nature generally, but certainly sure. government agencies just want to be able to do what they want to do. And that's kind of the core of this whole rule is like the, I mean, and, and that does play in, I think somewhat to the ghost gun kit situation because the ATF certainly doesn't like 
that no. concept either. No. Uh, they don't like the idea that you could buy a polymer 80 kit and make it, you know, in 30 minutes or whatever. And it's, and it's not as hard as it used to be to make um, a more advanced uh, semi-automatic firearm these days at home. Uh, you know, it was always possible. Obviously, the tradition of fire gun making is goes back to before the founding in this country and people have been making their own firearms for personal use forever. Uh, it's just now with your work and, and, you know, the work of uh, other people in the industry, it's become much more accessible for the average person. Uh, yeah. I, think, don't, I don't think they really liked it, frankly. You know, I, I was told, I don't know how true this is. I was told that another primary objective of the rule was to try to get a handle on 3d printed guns. And apparently it, be, it began in that place or it, mm. it began with what you were saying, a, a way to make a definition receiver, which got them out of trouble with the courts in California and other places. But I think they realized pretty quickly in the process that they, they couldn't get a handle on the 3D printed thing because you're, you're kind of making a component from almost nothing, essentially. Right. So um, they, they had to settle with this idea of redefining PMFs and creating the, the gunsmith ffl category and at least saying fine when these guns do show up somewhere with someone who's regulated you know they have to they have to be marked 